Before I uh, get into the message today, I want us to uh, celebrate again uh, some groups of people. Firstly, I'd love us to celebrate the Goo team for putting on the Goo Easter extravaganza. And there was around 60 children yesterday for two hours uh, together, which was amazing. And uh, so the team did a great job. Secondly, I'd like you to put your hands together for yourselves, but also our Acts of Kindness team who distributed the Easter eggs, did an incredible job. And then lastly, I'd love us to uh, thank and celebrate our creative team who lead us in worship so well. And uh, just Good Friday and even this morning, just uh, I've, I've done an incredible job. And so I can't wait till they get back up after this message and lead us again. So come on, let's celebrate all those guys. Lighting, sound, guys in the back doing an incredible job. Okay. If you could go back in history and see a certain moment, what would it be? What would that moment be? What would that moment be in history? Because there's something powerful about seeing. I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing and um, the obvious answer for myself being uh, a little bit mad on football was when England won the World Cup in 1966. And um, it wasn't that I wanted to relive it on TV and hear the famous commentary, they think it's all over. It is. Thank you. Um, but it was that I would be at Wembley Stadium, the moment Jeff Hurst put the ball in the back of the net, and uh, to just be there and to see it and to be part of it would have been something incredible. And there's something powerful about seeing. But have you ever been in a place where you would have loved to have been invited? You'd love to have been invited to something. You'd love to have been invited to come and see. You'd love to have been invited, but maybe there was a moment you were never invited. Well, uh, last week, our local football team, Chesterfield, won promotion to the Football League. Andy Phantom has been on his knees in front of God every single morning for the whole season, praying for it. Uh, but uh, we were there and we got to experience this incredible moment. Uh, five minutes before the end of the game, we were already on the pitch. Not, not quite on the pitch, but we were ready to run onto the pitch. The final whistle went and we ran onto the pitch. We were celebrating with the players and thousands of people ran onto the pitch. Then they had to get us off of the pitch to deliver the trophy. And, uh, and so then they... Uh, present the trophy, the team start walking around, then we enter the pitch again because it was like, you just can't hold us back, we're going to celebrate this. And um, I, I got to li like live this moment with my son, Zion, who uh, loves football uh, as much as me. Every single waking moment, he's got a football, kicking it around the house, much to Debbie's disgust and all of this. But we've been following Chesterfield all season. And uh, Zion loves taking selfies with players. And so there's a moment a player came off after being subbed off and they have to now go off at like the nearest point. And so that was near us. And uh, this player is Ollie Banks and he's walking around and Zion decides he's going to get up, up out of his seat, walk to the front and take a selfie. And then he comes back to the seat and he shows us the selfie and we are all laughing because this is the selfie. But it's incredible to, to look back on because we got that memory of what Zion did. But it's incredible because then uh, through Andy, actually, we got an invitation last week to go and see some of the players as they were celebrating. Got to, uh, a few of us got to have our photo taken with the trophy. I've got a picture of us here. We got to have our photo taken with the trophy last week. And it was uh, just an incredible, incredible moment. I don't know what that face is Tom Bray is pulling, uh, by the way. Uh, but it was an incredible moment. And it was an incredible invitation because we got to go and be a part of it. But there have been moments in my life where I haven't been invited. I haven't been invited to come and see. Th talking football again, I'm really sorry. I know it's Easter Sunday, but talking football again. Every year, 
uh, Debbie's auntie invites us to go down and watch Fulham versus Arsenal. She works for Fulham and we get to go in the players' lounge and it's incredible. We get to even talk to the Fulham players, but we're Arsenal fans. And so we're not bothered about the Fulham players, really. We're more bothered about the Arsenal players. And um, Sheffield United, you got robbed yesterday. You got robbed yesterday, definitely. Uh, but um, uh, we, we get to go. But Zion then gets to go and see the Arsenal players. I'm really excited for him. <laughs> like really excited for him. I don't know if you can tell, I've got my smiley face on right now. It's obvious, obviously. I'm really excited for him. There's a moment I'm like, can I go? Like, can I be invited? Because like I told you, Zion loves taking selfies. He's got a selfie here with Jesus. I mean, Gabriel Jesus. But it, we'd all love that invitation. We'd all love an invitation to come and see. An invitation is powerful. And today, I want to tell you, you've been invited. You've been invited today. And it's not just an invitation that was thrown out there willy-nilly. Anyone, like It's an invitation that is powerful to each and every one of us. But many times, we can either miss out on the invitation or we discount ourselves from that invitation. So Matthew 28 verses 1 to 10, read it together. It says this, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly. Tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said, they came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see him. It's these three words that I want to speak from today. And it's these three words that are in verse 6. Come and see. Come and see. And there's a QR code that the guys will throw up on the screen. You can follow along uh, with my notes on version, or you can go on how you access those on version as well through the events. Three lines. But here we've got these, in this account, Matthew's account, it's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and they're going to the tomb. They're going to the tomb and we could, we could, deduce today that uh, they're going to pay their last respects. It's the moment they're going to pay their last respects. Actually, in an, another version, it tells us that they're going with spices to anoint Jesus' body. And this is because uh, this weekend was the Sabbath, and so the burial of Jesus had been done pretty quickly. It'd been done in haste because of the time of year. And so they didn't want the, the bodies to be left on the cross over the Sabbath. And so they took them, uh, sorry, Passover. And they didn't want them to be, um, I, I had Passover in my head and I kept saying Sabbath, didn't I? Anyway, Sabbath's good on a Sunday. Uh, but it was Passover and so they didn't want the bodies to be left on the cross over Passover. And so they took them to the tomb. And uh, they did it in haste. And so they had this uh, moment where they were coming to anoint Jesus' body again. We see it in Mark 16, verses 1 to 3. It says this, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of this tomb? And so here they're going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, but they're asking this question in Mark's account, who's going to roll the stone away? And for many of us, when we're invited 
to a situation or invited to come and see, the question isn't who's going to roll away, but many times we discount ourselves from an invitation because of the circumstances of our life because of what we may be facing or what we may have gone through. We ask ourselves the question, who's going to sort that or who's going to deal with that? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to do this? We might even ask ourselves the question, what does my future look like? What does this look like in the future? And even for many of us, we discount ourselves by saying our past has denied us. Has my past denied us? You may have even asked those questions already today as you've come to church, as you've come into this place, even on Easter Sunday, that you know that there's an invitation to follow him, but you've already asked those questions. Can I really be invited? Is this really for me? Is it? But the resurrection lets us know that even in silence, it doesn't always mean absence. That loneliness doesn't always mean abandoned. That doubt doesn't always mean displaced. And failure doesn't always mean forever. And so in Matthew's account, we have Mary's, both the Mary's were invited to come and see, come and see where his body laid. Come and see. And today we, you, are invited to come and see. On this Easter Sunday, this celebration of Jesus, on this very day, you are invited to come and see. And I believe there's three things that we're invited to come and see. The first thing is this, you're invited to come and see what he's done. What he's done. Uh, For any parents in the place, there's that moment that you dread where maybe the house goes silent, especially when you've got multiple kids. We've got three boys and all of a sudden it goes silent in the house and you're like, oh no, what's going off? And then... You get the shout. Maybe it's, Dad, or if it's Zion shout to me, bro. <laughs> Not your bro. Bro, come and see what Jude's done. 98% of the time, it's not good. 2% of the time, it's, it's good. And you get this moment of, come and see what he's done, and that's usually negative. But in verse 6, it tells us what Jesus has done. It's the invitation. It says, he's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. What Jesus has done. I love this phrase, just as he said. That this is what Jesus had said. They'd heard it. They knew what Jesus was going to say. Jesus had told them what he was doing. And yet, even in this moment, they still don't get it. They still don't get what Jesus has done, do it. I don't know if you've ever had someone tell you something, but you didn't have a place for it. Wives, do not nudge your husbands right now. Because Debbie's more guilty of this than me. Even recently, in our house, we have had conversations that Debbie has then forgotten. Nathan, when did you open the Greek yogurt? And we're so posh in our house. When did you open the Greek yogurt? Because I need it for dinner. Debbie, we had this conversation. I asked you, do you need the Greek yogurt for dinner? And she said, no, we need the hummus, not the Greek yogurt for dinner. Oh, yeah. But I do need the Greek yogurt. So when did you open it? Have you ever had those moments where you've had a conversation, someone's told you something, but... You can't remember. And then you remember the context. Then you remember the context and you remember what has happened. Well, in the midst of Jesus' death, in the midst of the grief, in the midst of uh, the feeling of maybe it was all a waste following Jesus for this many years, in the midst of the questions of how do we go forward, the, the Marys had forgotten what Jesus had told them. They'd forgotten, even the disciples had forgotten. Maybe they were even asking the question, what does the future look like for us? They'd forgotten what he'd said. That's not just exclusive to the two Marys in this situation, but we do the same. In the midst of our chaos, in the midst of our circumstances, even just in the midst of daily life, we forget the promises that God has for us. 
We forget what God has done in our lives. We forget what he's, uh, he's done every single moment. We can even forget we come on a weekend like this. And we remember the cross and we take our time and we remember the cross and we come on a Sunday and we're full of celebration because the tomb is empty. We're remembering Easter Sunday, rightly so. But we should be like that every single day because he's done it. Not just for a special Sunday, he's done it for your Monday and he's done it for your Tuesday. He's done it so you can have life. We forget his victory. We can forget when he pulled us through. We can forget all of that in the midst of daily life. But I want to remind us today of what he's done. What he's done, Psalm 98 and verse 1. New Living Translation says this, Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. This is what he has done. Death has no sting anymore. Death has no sting. And whoever you are, wherever you find yourself, this is what he's done. He's invited you to come and see what he's done. He's invited you into the family. He's invited you and whatever it looks like, this is for all people, for every single one of us. But I love this because there's this, it's the two Marys and one of them is Mary Magdalene and uh, that, that basically just means Mary of a place called Magdala and Mary Magdalene is at the tomb and she's invited to come and see where Jesus lay. But for many of us, we don't know her past. But in the scriptures, it tells us that she was delivered from seven demons. Not three, four, or five, seven demons. This is what Jesus had done for her. You know, some scholars say she may have been a prostitute. Some say she was into all kind of things. But no matter her past, she was invited to come and see what Jesus had done. No matter what happened, she invited to come and see. Jesus brought about victory. Jesus brought about a deliverance. He's done the same for me and he's done the same for you today. And the invitation today is to come and see what he's done. Come and see the victory that he's won. Come and see. This is for you to come and see. He invited Mary Magdalene, the first one who came to the tomb, to come and see where his body lay. He's risen. He's not here. The first person to receive that news, she had seven demons in her past. I don't know, because our world would have cancelled her. But God doesn't. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself today, you are invited to come and see what he has done through the resurrection. The resurrection has power. Come and see what he's done. The second thing is you're invited to come and see what he's doing. It tells us that he, he, the angel says, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. He's going ahead of you into Galilee and then you will see him. There's more to come. Jesus is at work right now. You know, there's a, a great lyric I, I came up with actually. And I think we should add it into a song, maybe called Waymaker. It says this, even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. So, side note, there was... Um, when I was uh, leading youth, uh, Hillsong United, I think it was, wrote a song called Go or Giving It All Away as it was rebranded. But I kind of got, I don't know how I got like early access to it. So I wrote out all the lyrics. And then I got all the youth guys and said, I've wrote this incredible song, guys. I've wrote this amazing song. And it goes like this. I've even got the tune. I've got everything to it. I've got it. And it goes like this. We're giving it all away. away. And they were like, this is brilliant. It's amazing. I went, I didn't write it, guys. But we need to do it. But even when I don't feel it, you're working. God's at work. And we're invited to come and see what he's doing. We're invited tonight. You are invited to come and see what he's doing through baptism. 
tonight, people are going to go from their old life to their new life. They're going to be brought into the family of God. You know, baptism tonight is not just a celebration of people going public with their faith. It's actually a moment where they become part of the family of believers. And so we get to be part of that and say, we're here. We are with you. We're celebrating with you. You are welcome into this place. And it's a moment where we get to come and see what he's doing. Isaiah 43 and verse 19 says this, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Where there seems to be no way, he makes a way. That's what he does. Uh, Another great character in the story is Peter. And um, many of us know Peter because on that moment when the Holy Spirit falls, the church is born, and that moment, uh, Peter gets up and preaches. But many of us will know his backstory in the moment around the cross. He denies Jesus three times. Denies Jesus three times. And yet, here's what Jesus does. He restores him. And look what I'm going to do. You see, Peter... I'd been given a promise. His name was Simon beforehand. And yet there's a moment where Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter responds and says, you're the Messiah, the son of God. And he says, no longer are you called Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, how many of us discount ourselves from what God is doing right now because of a moment of failure? Peter denied Jesus three times in that moment. I'm guessing he thought, well, he can't build the church on this rock anymore. But Jesus made a way. He's doing a new thing. He makes a way, even in the wilderness, he makes a way in our lives. One of the uh, Christian artists I kind of listened to when I was growing up, there weren't many great ones, but one of them was uh, called DC Talk. Anyone? Their best album was Jesus Freak. What will people do when they hear that I'm a Jew? I'll have to stop because of copyright on YouTube and everything. It's, it's like so lightness. My, 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 favorite, my favorite line in it is it. My favorite kind of section in that song. And sorry this, if this offends you, but it wasn't my lyrics. I didn't write these ones. I only wrote the ones I spoke about earlier. Um, um, it goes, um, I've got to get it in my head now. I'm going to rap in a moment, so get ready, all right? It's going to blow your mind. Um, I can't remember it. I was practicing it all day yesterday. Anyway, something about a fat belly, and it wriggled around like marmalade jelly. It took me a while to catch what it said, but it had to match the rhythm of his belly with my head. Jesus saves is what it raved in a typical tattoo green. He rode on a box in the middle of the city and he claimed he had a dream. Anyway, that was it. But whilst that was a good song and you can go and listen to it and realize, Nathan, you, you should get a record contract and all of that. They had this really cheesy song called New Thing. And they were really cool because they spelt new thing, N, new, N-U, and then thing, thang, like in all capitals. And uh, it, it like went, God is doing, I didn't realize I was going to sing this much in the message. God is doing a new thing. And it just kept going over and over again. And I was like, yeah, I don't like that one. That's so cheesy. But do you know what? God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing in your life. He's doing a new thing. There's new life for you. He's doing a new thing. He's making a way where there seems to be no way. And I want to encourage you today because it may look different to how it looked before. When they were following Jesus for three years, he's there, they're following him along and it's like everything's great because Jesus is doing it all. They're watching Jesus perform incredible miracles. There's a moment where Jesus sends them out with authority. I love it, but they have the security that Jesus is there with them. They're seeing Jesus teach and they're seeing thousands of people come and hear his teaching. They're seeing Jesus take five loaves and two fish and feed a multitude of people. They're 
doing all of this. And now he's going to do a new thing. But the new thing is he's not going to be there. They're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to take the message into the world. And so it may look different, but God is doing something in your life. God is at work in your life. And I want to encourage you today, Romans 8 and verse 28 says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He has a new purpose, a new passion, something greater than ever before. And he's doing something new in your life. And he's doing something in your life right now. And the promise is this, that no matter where you are, every single day, he's doing something. Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. The kids get it. (laughs) They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This is you. You are invited to come and see today. You're invited not just to come and see what he's done, but you're invited to come and see what he's doing here and right now. I'm so thankful to be part of a church, Icon Church, that believes that God is at work. Every single time we meet, every single time in our connect groups, prayer meetings, wherever it is, we want to know and see what God is doing in people's lives. Today, after the service, here, there'll be a prayer team. God's at work. God can bring about miracles. God can bring about breakthroughs. He can bring about a new thing in your life. This is for you. The resurrection shouts at us. You are invited to come and see what he's doing. And finally, the team are going to get back up. Come and see. You're invited to come and see what he's about to do. What he's about to do. You see... The resurrection isn't just for the past or even the present, just for the present, but it's for the future as well. The empty tomb tells us that there's a future. There's a future for each of and every, every single one of us. It tells us that death is not the end, that death is not the end, that there's a future for every single one of us. Um, I was... Um, thinking on this and I was just reminded again of many people that maybe I've met through football or played football against who have thought there was no future and have ended up taking their own life and I was like it's so sad because there's part of me that goes I wish I could have had a conversation I wish I could have just told you about Jesus. I wish I could have told you about the hope. I wish I could have told you about the empty tomb that tells us that there's a future for you and the future is not just after death, but the future can be here and now that you can experience life and life to the full now. You can have hope in this life no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through. There's a future for you. There's a future even now. And I could, I just wish I could have got their eyes off of the very things that maybe caused them in that moment to think there's no point anymore and to lift up their eyes to Jesus who saves, who has a future. You see, I want to lift our eyes to come and see what he's about to do today. To know that he has a future for you, for each and every one of us to lift up our eyes. In verse 8 of Matthew 28, it tells us that they were afraid, yet filled with joy. As they went away from this account, they were afraid, yet filled with joy. I don't know what tomorrow might hold for you, but might feel a little bit fearful. But actually, you can go from this place in joy. It might be a little bit of fear, but you know what? Perfect love casts out all fear. And today you can walk in the joy that God has for you. Because Jesus does what he says he will do. Just as he said, the tomb's empty, just as he said. If you go searching for Jesus' body, it was never found. Because he's alive. He's risen. 
and he's alive today. And he has a future for each and every one of us. And here's the promise for you and for me is this, that whatever he has promised, he will do what he says he will do. That there's a future. Philippians 1 and verse 6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on. Won't, won't half do it. Won't stop when it gets a little bit tough. No, he'll carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The empty tomb is evidence for us today that Jesus does what he said he will do. Baptism tonight. This is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to take old life and he's going to put it into new life. We are going to be immersed into the waters. These people who are publicly declaring their faith, they're going to be immersed into the waters and they're going to come up in this new life. Why? Because Jesus does what he says he will do. That they are invited into the family. And so we can be confident today. We can come and see what he's about to do. We can come and see it. And so I want to lift up our eyes to Jesus today to lift up our eyes to him who has a future for each and every one of us. Psalm 139, verses seven to 12, tells us this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. Wherever you find yourself today, he's there and he has a future for you. And so it's our hope, not in our circumstance, not in other things, but we are invited to place our hope in Jesus. Come and see. And you see, the resurrection is an invitation for all to come and see. Just like I'd love that invitation to go and meet some of the Arsenal players and to get my own selfies. The empty tomb is an invitation for all. Nobody's left out. Nobody's sat back waiting. No, the invitation is for all to come and see. But not just see, but experience his life. You see, humanity can't help but search, yet doesn't know where to look. And today is the day that we remember that Jesus rose again and proved that he is the one we are looking for. For he is the saviour. He is the solution. He is the cure to humanity's longing. He is risen today. And so today, you're invited to know Jesus, the saviour and hope of the world. To experience his love and to live a new life life with Jesus so let's all stand in this place and today I want to give you that invitation to come and see today I want to give you the invitation to know Jesus for the first time or to know him again maybe you wandered away from that relationship but today you're coming back and saying I need to recommit my life to him and so today we're going to just pray a simple prayer it'll be this Jesus I give you my life Jesus I give you my life so with every head bowed every eye closed you want to accept that invitation to know Jesus whether for the first time or as a moment to come back into that relationship knowing that he has invited you knowing that the resurrection is that invitation for you to know him today we're just going to pray that prayer Jesus I give you my life so let's pray it after three one two three Jesus I give you my life if today you pray that prayer for the first time as a recommitment I'd love you to just put your hand in the air so I can see you so I can pray for you. Today you're saying yes to Jesus. Pray that prayer for the first time or as a recommitment. Just raise your hand right now. 
saying yes to him. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for every single person that is declaring that in their life. They're accepting that invitation to come and see. Pray that they would know your blessing. They would know your spirit. They would know you at work in their life. They would experience your love and your grace. And even right now, we, as your people, accept that invitation again to come and see. To come and see what you've done. To know that on that cross, you took us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That was a love supreme. That you took us from the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. And today we walk in that freedom and that life that you have for us. Today we accept that invitation to come and see what you are doing right now. We believe even if we don't feel it, even if we can't see it, we know that you're at work in our lives. We thank you, God. Lord, over our prayers as we pray for other people that you're at work in their lives. We lift up our family, our friends, the people who don't know you, Jesus. And we pray God be at work in their lives. We believe you are doing more in the background than we can see in the foreground. And today, Jesus, we uh, accept your invitation to come and see what you're about to do. You're doing something, but you're about to do something even greater. We declare that God, that you are a good God who carries things on to completion. And you are a God who does what He says He will do. And so we declare that over our lives. We declare that over our families. We declare that over us today and we accept your invitation. And we declare today, Jesus, that you are risen, that you are alive and that we put our trust in you. And so today, Jesus, again, we give you our lives. We declare that you are mighty, that you are powerful and you deserve all the honour, all the glory and all the praise. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Come on, let's worship Him together.